Welcome to worship today. If we haven't met before, my name is Simon and I'm part of the ministry team here at Hobart City Church. It's great to welcome you to worship. The sun is shining, the air is cool, it is good to be together to worship today. Uh, just have some announcements for you to let you know what's happening around the place. So if you just want to look to the screen, version. just go to version. it's a free app, you can download it to your phone or your device, search for Hobart City Church under events and the sermon notes for a little bit later on are there. Um, today we are starting a new series called Home. Um, there's a free prayer journal for everyone here. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a journal for you to, to use in the week between Sunday. So there'll be a, a bit of text uh, and a question there for you to reflect upon for the week. So it'll connect this Sunday with next Sunday as we journey through this seven week series called Home. Fire Pit Friday is coming up. So this coming Friday night, uh, a men's ministry opportunity uh, out at the Henderson's place around the fire pit, uh, 7.30 start, yes, got that right, um, 7.30 to about 10, uh, there's a poster at the back there behind where Kay is sitting, um, now if, if it's raining and blowing a gale of course we won't do it, so keep your eyes on the weather forecast for Friday night, um, we'll put it on the Facebook page if we're going to cancel it. Um, otherwise, if you have any questions on the day, you can give Wayne a ring, give me a ring and we'll let you know if it's on. But this is this coming Friday night and then it will be on the fourth Friday of the month, again, weather permitting, going forward. Baptisms, yes, November the 8th, uh, we're having three baptisms on that Sunday. Um, the invitation is out there for anyone who is contemplating taking uh, this next step or the first step on your journey. Um, the waters will be there, you are welcome to be baptised on that Sunday. Uh, if you are thinking about it, please speak to me or one of the elders afterwards, um, but I will make the offer from the waters on the day. That if you are here and you are feeling God saying, yes, now is the time that there will be an opportunity for you to, to be baptised. Um, that, so that's on Sunday, November the 8th. Now, after the service, again, weather permitting, we're going to have a church picnic. Uh, it'll be in the Fitzroy Gardens, which are over that way. Uh, it'll be bring your own absolutely everything. Uh, and we are going to be a group of random people who happen to be meeting in a, in a general part of Hobart together to have a, have a lunch. It's not a, a formal event, um, so we won't have a plan and a structure and a fire marshal and all that sort of stuff. But if you, if you can make it, that'd be great. We'll just spend some time just having some food, playing some games, come when you can, leave when you must, no pressure at all. Um, so that'll be after the service on November the 8th, so baptisms at the morning service and a, a picnic lunch in the gardens in the afternoon as a way to kick back and relax and hopefully enjoy the sunshine of spring. Next up, we are up to that point in the service now, so I've been saying this all the time, part of our COVID planning is just to have less things that we're all touching, so there's four places around the building where you can go if you've come prepared to give an offering for the work of God's uh, work here in the church here in Hobart City, uh, of you're making a tithe uh, and little containers at the front as well for uh, the Love Loaf where we uh, sponsor our, um, our sponsor children, so a gold coin donation in there. And after that, kids, you can head off downstairs for Kids Church, meet Tamara up in the back corner, look out for the bright green t-shirts and don't forget if you didn't grab a journal on your way in and you would like one, perhaps make a beeline for the welcome desk and grab one of those. Naomi is over there waiting to hand them out. Thank you for listening. Set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church, we need your power, we seek your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives, 
struggling through this COVID time and finding it difficult. I have. I give lectures and talks on anxiety and I have had anxiety during this time. So I have really had to uh, take some of my own medicine. But we've been hearing in the media just how many other people are suffering from anxiety and from mental health issues that have got worse during this time. In fact, the other night on TV, there was a Melbourne doctor saying, we need to close this lockdown and finish it because the issues of mental health are becoming so big that they're really going to dwarf the effect of the virus. There's no doubt that fear and anxiety have a disabling and a paralyzing effect on us emotionally, but they also affect us physically. You can have increase of ulcers, heart disease, cancer. And back in the Bible times, fear was behind the 11 disciples who were cowering in the dark in the Garden of Gethsemane, leaving Jesus to the mercy of the guards who came for him. Later on, it was fear that caused Peter to deny he was a follower of Jesus. Yet only a few weeks later, something very powerful converted these fearful men and they became the early champions of the church, spreading the good news of Jesus all around the world, some of them dying martyrs' deaths. That's not fear. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that invaded their minds and their hearts, infusing them with courage and with passion. So when our thinking goes to fear and anxiety, how do we manage it? How do we cope with this? So a little bit of my medical background here. An accepted treatment of anxiety is called cognitive therapy. It teaches the patient to get to know what they are thinking about in their heads, in their minds. And you ask the question of yourself to figure this out. Is this thought true? Is it accurate? Am I being catastrophizing here? Um, are other people likely to back up this thought as an accurate thought? So in the medical world, we largely say thinking comes first and emotions follow that. So therefore, what goes on in our heads are, is very, very important. Fear is concern and a worry about the future. And the antidote for fear is trust. So in today's world, who can we trust? Or what can we trust? Our family, our friends, our government? Can they keep us safe? No, all these people and organisations have the ability to let us down because they're human like us. Trust in God is our only hope as he is all powerful, all knowing. He is a loving and eternal being. He loves us so much that he sent his only son to come down here to earth 
and then to die on a cross in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. We can trust him as he does know our circumstances. He promises to provide the strength we need to cope and to persist through our difficult times. He doesn't promise to rescue us, which I find hard. <laughs> it would be so nice if he did, but we know he walks beside us. Do you remember the poem about the footprints in the sand? I think everyone remembers that poem. When we're going through difficulties, it's often one set of footprints that are left in the sand. And they are the ones of Jesus when he is carrying us. Through some of my difficult times in the last few months, I've been drawn to Philippians 4, 6 to 7, and it's in the Passion Translation, so it's quite different. Don't be pulled in different directions or be worried about anything. Be saturated in prayer throughout the day offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life, then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. We need to fill our minds with scripture and with accurate thinking, being grateful to God for his saving grace rescuing us from our sins, and then we need to draw on the power of the Holy Spirit to help us control our fearful thinking. So let us pray and give thanks for the emblems that we have in this little disposable pack. The wafer representing the body of Jesus who died on the cross on our behalf, and the juice representing the blood of Jesus that was shed and he who cleanses us from our sin. So just before we take them, let's just pray. Thank you, God, our Father, for removing the penalty of our sins through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Now we have no fear of judgment. Help us to remember that we can trust you to help us with our fears through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us as your presence, walking alongside us and sometimes even carrying us. Remind us that you will never leave us or forsake us in our times of difficulty. Amen. So eat the wafer and drink the juice in your own time. So a few months ago, uh, during the series we did called Brave, we're looking through the life uh, of David and Esther, I confess to you all that I happen to like those 4X real-time strategy computer games, the, what, what I call the God games, where you look down upon high and a little civilization, you get to click on them and make them do your will. Now after the service, um, someone who shall remain nameless, um, came up to me, a fellow gamer, and wanted to know why, of all the sorts of computer games that are out there, why did I like that sort? I'd honestly never really given that much thought, really. That was just the game. But I, I had no actual answer to that question. And that bugged me. And so, you know, you know that time of the morning at about 4.30? when you lie awake in your bed and, and your brain is trying to get you to solve all the difficult questions of the universe, you know that time of the morning? I lay there and I tried to solve this problem. I, I thought it through, I prayed it through, and then I went theological on it. One of the things, one of the reasons I think for me liking these games so much is that this particular genre of games, and there are others who will like it too, but this particular one has within it this element of grace. And what I mean by that is that no matter how many times I stuff things up, I can just stop and start all over again. Now, when you think about it, 
Grace is kind of, sort of, maybe, kind of intrinsic to the computer industry. Stay with me, IT people. (laughs) I'll hopefully explain myself. Because when you are happily on your computer and you maybe have got one or two more apps open than you really should have open on your desktop, or, or maybe you've dived down the rabbit hole of the World Wide Web and you've clicked on way too many hyperlinks and you've got 17 tabs open and somewhere in the background there is a MIDI file playing and you can't quite figure out where that's coming from and you decide perhaps you should stop and your mouse freezes and you get the blue screen of death. What is that single piece of advice that the IT person will give a pleb like me to solve this problem. I'm hearing a few reboots, I'm hearing something like that, yes. Well, I I thought we should actually refer this to an actual IT department to find out what they would say. So let's see if I can get this to work. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Hello, IT. Yeah, have you tried turning it off and on again? Hello, IT. (laughs) uh, Something's wrong with my computer. Have you tried turning it off and on again? (laughs) No, 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 no. oh dear, thanks. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? (laughs) Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Hello, IT? Have you tried turning it off? You know what, I'm sick of saying that. (laughs) From this moment on, everything is going to be different. (laughs) Hello, IT? Have you tried turning it off and on again? (laughs) Yeah, but that's an important part of the process. Yes, if you don't complete that part, there's no way that you're going to be able to do the next bit. Okay, so now, turn it back on again. (laughs) Hello, IT? (laughs) Yaha? Have you tried forcing an unexpected reboot? If you haven't seen that, it's from a TV show called The IT Crowd. It's one of my favourite shows. And mostly, turning it off and on again does solve the problem, unless it's something really serious. It gives the system a refresh. It restores everything back to a point where it was working okay. It allows you to have another go. It's just that in the computing world, this type of grace lacks the repentance element. There's not a sense of recognising that, yeah, we may have done the wrong thing, we may have gone down the wrong path, we may have opened too many things and we make a commitment to not do that again. But still, you know, it's a quick reset. Click the home button, things get refreshed the problems of the past get washed away. About four months into the year 2020, this meme started doing the rounds. We probably all had those moments this year, haven't we? A desire to begin again, or perhaps to skip forward through to the end. I mean, how many of us in the year 2015, when asked the question, where do you see yourselves in five years? Answered, Well, in lockdown due to global pandemic. We didn't have this as part of our forward planning. If only we could start this year again. Well, today I have some good news, my friends. No, I have not discovered the home key for 2020. I haven't figured out how to refresh this year yet, but I can promise you, with as much faith and as much certainty as I have, that God is a God of grace. That God is a God of resets, of do-overs, of second chances. Our God is a God of the refresh, of the new beginnings. When we turn our lives towards God, when we place our future in the hands of Jesus, when we repent of our past, when we publicly express a desire to follow Him, our lives get refreshed. Our lives are renewed. We get a new beginning. The writer of the Lamentations says it like this, But this I call to mind. 
and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Who's humming the hymn? They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The premise of this seven-week series, which we have called Home, is that God offers us all a refresh, a restart. And God knows we could all do with one. So starting from today, we're going to re-enter the big story of God. And we're going to step through week by week all the major themes of our faith. And through the Sunday message and through the prayer journals, we will get a chance to return home, to refresh some part of our life. So before we dive into this week, I want you to think about this. Is there one aspect, element, area, decision thought process in your life that could do with a new beginning. If you could try turning something off and back on again in your life, what would it be? Where in your life could you do with a fresh start? Is there something that could do with a new beginning? If there is, take out your journal and write that thing in there. If nothing's coming to mind, then perhaps ask God as we pray to show you that thing. So let's pray. Almighty God, giver and sustainer of all life, forgiver of our trespasses and mistakes of all shapes and sizes, Lord, as we click home and start this sermon series, help us to identify an area of our lives that you would have us start again. A habit to break, an attitude to change, an action you would like us to take for the first time, a way of looking at ourselves you would like us to stop. And Lord, as we take this journey home with you, being reminded of your plan, of your story and our place in it, make us, like your mercies and compassion, new every morning, so that we can shine the glory of your kingdom to all that we meet. Lord, may the things that come from me this day be forgotten, but the things that are of you and your word change us forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So once we've clicked the home key, once we've switched everything off and back on again, we automatically go to the beginning. Therefore, our theme for week one of this series, spoiler alert, is created. We need to remember that we are created by God in the image of God and that we are created for a purpose. We are not here by accident. If I was to ask you, how would you share with someone God's big story? Do you reckon you could do it? For the last 300 years or so, there's been a dominant way that people answer that question. And it was different before that, but at some point in around about the year 1700, around about the start of the Age of Enlightenment, around about the era of the Industrial Revolution, the way the church began to talk about God's big story shifted, just slightly, but it shifted. And I think this this slight shift, at least the way I read it, has changed the way that we as Christians and the church has been seen 
in the world in which we live and the world in which we share the good news of Jesus. Now, I certainly didn't make up this concept. I know I heard it somewhere, I went, but I went to find it this week, went to Google it, I cannot find where it comes from. So this is not, Simon's had a bright idea. Someone else did and I've remembered it, I just can't remember who. But I've called this slight shift the four chapter change because that's what it is. We've changed the story about four chapters. So, this is where the whiteboard comes in. So, for about the last 300 years, if you were asked to share with someone the, the Christian faith, typically, the story would start with sin. That we live in a fallen world. That sin is part of our story. So I've put an S there. It could also be a snake. I'm not an artist. I apologise. And we would start the story by saying we live in a fallen world and people can recognise that. This is a world of pain. And we'd say there's great evil around us and we have within us the potential for, for great evil as well. So we need to be careful. We need to be mindful of who we are and how we behave and the choices that we make. But amid these choices, God sent His Son, Jesus. And His death upon the cross changes things. His blood defeats that evil. But still we have to be careful because at the end of the story, I need a red pen for this, there is a lake of fire and there is judgment. But Jesus opens up a way for those who believe. But we need to be careful because this is where it's heading. Have you heard that story? Has someone ever told you God's story like that? Now, please do not mishear me. I am not saying that this is not part of our story because it certainly is. However, if we just tell this story like this, it's like going and watching your favourite TV show, your favourite movie, but coming in 10 minutes after it starts and leaving before you get to the end. You're missing out on some really important parts of the story. You've missed, in God's story, four essential chapters. Because if, if we live within this story arc, if, if we look at the world, if we experience the world with this as our prime narrative, then the way we look at the world changes dramatically. This is a world of tension, of struggle, of strain. This is a world about fighting a battle. This is a severe world. This is a world in which we are the fun police. We are the moral police. You may have heard the church called that. Yet if we take a step back, if we actually put in those four missing chapters of God's story, if we look at the story of God the way it was intended to be seen, the start and the end change dramatically. You see, if the story ends here, with judgment and fire, and trying to avoid such a, an end, if it ends with death and Hades and judgment and a lake of fire, then it appears as though what we are trying to do is scare people into the kingdom. Something which Jesus and Paul never did. I remember as a 13-year-old being in the church and, and the, the pastor thumping the pulpit a number of times and ending up saying, if you walk out of here this morning and you get hit by a bus, do you know where you're going? And I shook in my shoes but he was trying to scare me into the kingdom. He wasn't trying to love me there. But if we follow this story from Jesus and we go all the way through to the end of the actual Bible, the end looks different. Because the end of Scripture is actually, again, excuse my artwork, it is 
a new heaven, a new earth. This is supposed to be a new Jerusalem here coming down out of the clouds. I am not an artist. Let me just draw Australia. Don't forget Tasmania at the bottom there. And Asia is there, is India, and there's water and stuff. A new earth and a new heaven. The city of God coming down from the clouds. God dwelling with his people. The river of the water of life feeding the tree of life, which produces fruit and healing for all. That's the way the story ends. I mean, what a way to end God's story. Likewise, if we go back two chapters at the start, back to Genesis chapter 1. Did you get Australia and Tasmania and everything else? There we go. If we go back to the beginning, the story starts with God and with good. Because if we start the story at the fall, if we start the story there, it changes how we see ourselves. It changes how we see each other. It changes how we interact with the world around us. We become our own worst enemies, our own antagonists. Yet that's not the way God began the story. So today, I want to remind you of the beginning. That we were created by God in the image of God to partner with God and in God's words, what he saw was very good. So, I am going to try and channel one of my favourite preachers from the last 20 years and step us through Genesis chapter 1, the creation poem. Now, I call it a poem because that is what it is. It doesn't quite come across that well in English, but in the Hebrew, it is a poem. At the time of writing, the ancient Hebrews lived in a world where they were surrounded by a lot of powerful civilizations. And all of these civilizations had their own creation stories. And they all had a bit of a similar, similar vibe to them. That they told a story whereby the, the, the earth and all that we can see and touch and feel was created um, due to a cosmic battle that took place between two warring gods. And the earth either comes out of the collateral damage from their battle or it is birthed from the, the fallen God. And this was their creation stories. And the ancient Hebrews went, nah, that's, that's not how it began. That's not how we understand creation. We have another way of telling you how it all began. Sure, there was a little bit of chaos right there at the start, but we are all here intentionally. All of this has a purpose and we are designed by a God who just loves to make things. And so they began this poem. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in this poem, God is Elohim. Say Elohim. 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 This is one of the many names that God has given throughout the Old Testament. But in Genesis chapter 1, God is Elohim. So in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Now this word created in the Hebrew is bara. Say bara. It's a guttural word. It, it, it means intent. It means to create with purpose. It's the sort of word we would use to describe what, what Wayne and Donna do in their business. They bara joinery. It's what Kevin's going to be doing this afternoon at the concert. He bara music. He's not just going to play some random notes. This is created. There is thought. There is 
purpose. There is intent. So in the beginning, Elohim bara the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without form. It was empty. Darkness and chaos covered its face. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we discover here that Elohim is also spirit. In the Hebrew, the word is ruach. Say ruach. And you've got to breathe out at the end. A lot of Hebrew word, you need a bit of phlegm to get it properly, but this is just a ruach. It means breath. It means wind. But it's not a stagnant, stale wind. This is a life-giving wind. It's a breath. It's the same word that's used when, when God breathes life into creation in Genesis chapter 2 in the second creation story, when God breathed the breath of life into Adam, it's the same word. This is Ruah. This is the Spirit of God. And then Elohim said, let there be light. And there was. So Elohim speaks. His word has power. So in verse 1, we learn that God is a creator. In verse 2, we learn that God is spirit. And in verse 3, we learn that God is word. This God is a community. This God is three in one. He is a community of creativity, a family of future-orientated inventiveness. And this is only three verses. What a way to begin the most read book in all of human history. It goes on. And God saw that the light was good. And so he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and he called the darkness night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. You remember I said this is a poem? This is the first refrain. This is the, a repeated line that you will crop up throughout the creation poem. It signifies to us that this is the end of a day. There was evening and there was morning, the first day. And then God said, let there be a dome to separate the waters below from the waters above. And God called this dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning. The second day. And then God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered in one place, and let dry ground emerge. And so he called the dry ground land, and he called the gathered waters seas. And then God said, Let the land bring forth plants and vegetation. And it was so. And there was evening and there was morning. The third day. And then God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark the seasons and the days and the years. And so God made two great lights. The greater light, the sun, he he, he placed to govern the day. And the lesser light, the moon, he placed to govern the night. And he also made of the stars. And there was evening and there was morning. The fourth day. Now I want to pause the poem right here because this raises a couple of questions for me and I don't expect anyone to answer them because I don't have answers either. But they interest me. This will give you an insight into the weird workings of my mind. I am not much of a gardener. I wish that I was, but the truth is I'm not. But one thing I do know about a garden is the importance of sunshine. Your plants need to get good sunshine in order for them to grow. So so it, it, it says to me that God's pretty clever because on day three, he creates plants and on day four, he creates the sun. Otherwise, we're living in Mushroom City. 
The second thing that dawned on me as we're going through this creation poem was that we use the sun, the moon and the stars to measure the length of a day, don't we? Sun up to sundown, that's a day. Sun, moon and stars on day four. How do we measure day one, two and three? I don't have an answer. But I like to think about these things. So we go on. And then God said, let the water teem with life. Let there be fish and crabs and whales and lobsters and dolphins and krill and all sorts of things. I could be here all morning listing them all. And let the birds fly across the sky. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters and the seas, let the birds increase upon the earth. You guys will figure out how to do that. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And then God said, let the land produce living creatures, livestock, wild animals and everything in between, each according to its kind. And it was so. And then God said, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness. And so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. Increase in number and fill the earth and care for it. Manage the fish in the sea and the birds in the air and every living creature that moves along the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has seeds in it, and they will be yours for food. To all the beasts of the earth and the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move upon the ground, everything that has breath in it, I give you the green plants for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And then there was evening and there was morning. The sixth day. And this is where the structure of the poem breaks off. So if I was clever enough to be able to read this to you in Hebrew and really get the, the rhythm and the cadence going and you'd happen to nod off because it was so comforting, at this point in the poem, this is when you are jarred awake something has gone wrong, something doesn't rhyme with that which comes before. And so you sit up and you take notice, what's about to be said is important. And so we read on, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Anyone here good at resting? I'm seeing mouths nodding your head, that's good. I'm bad at resting. But even in the beginning, God could see the temptation that we would have to become human doings and not human beings. So even right at the start, God put in place this principle of rest, of downing tools, of putting your feet up, taking a deep breath. So this is the start of the Bible. This is the beginning of God's story. This is the alternate creation story. This is the one which is about purpose and intent and care. It's about family and creativity and joy. It's not about conflict or coincidence or collateral damage. So if we look at that, what do we see? What can we take away? Well, on a practical level, we can say that, well, the sun and the moon and the stars 
that relates to day one. The birds, well, they go in the sky. The fish, they go in the sea. Sun, moon and stars, also in the sky. Living creatures on the land. Humanity, same place. There's a bit of structure there. God didn't make anything before it had a place to go. Also, the, the first three days of creation seem to be about God separating, separating day from night, earth from sky, land from sea. And then in days four to six, God fills that which had been separated with that which had been created. It's almost like there's a bit of planning that's gone on here, isn't there? There's purpose. There's logic. There's thought behind all this. But if we were to look a little bit closer, go a little bit deeper, I wonder what else this poem could teach us. Well, the ancient Hebrews, they had a system where they would use numbers which correspond with letters if they wanted to really emphasise a point. They wanted to make sure that the people who were reading this really got it. They would use numbers in an interesting way. This is called gematria. And it's a system, a numerological system by which all Hebrew letters have a corresponding number value. So that any particular word in the Hebrew language, you could add up the value of all the letters and it would tell you how important that word is. But of course, each of the numbers has a meaning behind it as well. Now, it's what are we, now it's 10 past 11. We could be here till 3 and we wouldn't even begin to scratch the surface. So, don't worry, we're not going to be here that long. But if we were just to look at some of the, the big numbers, the important numbers, the prime numbers, what do we get out of this? Well, firstly, this word, bara, which is the theme of this poem. This is the creation poem. This word is used three times. It's used first when God creates the canvas. It's used second in verse 21 when God creates living beings. It's used again in verse 27 when God creates humanity. And then when God creates humanity, he uses the word three times to describe how he's creating us. Let's not forget what we learnt right at the start, that Elohim, God, is three in one, creator, spirit, word. This number three, it means completeness, it means perfection, it means stability. But there's more than just threes. Let's look at the number seven. In Hebrew, the first verse of this creation poem has seven words. The second verse has 14 words, seven times two. The word earth occurs 21 times, seven times three. The seventh paragraph has 35 words, seven times five. The word God, Elohim, also occurs 35 times. But we don't stop there. The phrase, and God saw, occurs seven times. The phrase, of every kind, occurs seven times. There are sevens and patterns of sevens all throughout this creation poem. And seven, in the Hebrew system of understanding numbers, means God's perfect creation. It means God's perfect blessing. It really is as though there's some real thought behind this, isn't there? Now, perhaps you're thinking to yourself, well, Simon, that's all very interesting, but what's your point? And I'm glad you're thinking that and not thinking, I'm hungry, what should I have for lunch? Because my point is this. You are all created in the image of God. The person sitting next to you is created in the image of God. 
The person sitting in front of you and behind you is created in the image of God. The person you like least in the world is created in the image of God, as is the person you love the most. We are all, the Bible says, created in the divine image. We are not here by accident. Like this poem, there is structure to who we are, there is purpose to who we are. We are infused with God's divine breath, His Holy Spirit. As the psalmist said many years later, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. Do you know that? Do you know that what God has made is wonderful? That you are wonderful? That no matter how down on yourself you may be, that when God looks at you, God knows you, that God loves you, that God wants nothing but the best for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Thank you. Making sure you're awake. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. God loved us all so much that He not only created us and set us on our way, but when He looked at all that He had made, when He had looked at us, He described us as being very good. In the creation poem, God looks, God sees, God creates, and He says it's good seven times. And the seventh time, when He creates us, He looks at us and says, this is very good good. So good that much later in the story, and we will get to this as we unpack this series, that God moves into our neighbourhood just to show us how good life can be when we choose to live our life for Him. But that's for a couple of weeks. So, as we end, remember this. You are created by God. You are created in the divine image of God. You are created for a purpose and in God's eyes, you are very good. So as you take some time this week to to think about an area in your life that you would like a new start, that you would like a fresh beginning, remember how God sees you as fearfully and wonderfully made. Welcome home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory, power and praise for the way that you have made all things upon the earth. Thank you for creating us in your image and for inviting us to become your creative partners. Lord, when we have done less than a stellar job of reflecting your image to those around us, we are sorry. In those times... As they come before us into the future, Lord, help us to remember that in every face we see, we see a reflection of your glory and that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. As with all creatures of our God and King, we lift up our voices to sing your praises. Amen.
Thank you for being with us at worship today. If you didn't manage to get a journal and would like one, I have a, a stack at the front. I can give you one of those after the service. I hope that God has had something for you today that you can take with you into the week ahead. If you've signed a child into Kids Church, make sure you sign them out again before you head off home. Uh, thank you to our COVID cleaning team who will come through in a few minutes to clean. Uh, we need to get ready for this afternoon's service. So if you can make your way to the back or into the cafe space as soon as you can, that would be greatly appreciated. But thank you for being with us at worship. I don't know about you, but singing that hymn at the end, Mr. Bean jumps into my head. <laughs> Spent some time this afternoon Googling Mr. Bean, hallelujah. And then sing that song again with great gusto. But as we move uh, from this space into whatever God has for us today, let's remember that wherever we go, we wear the name of Jesus. Let's wear his name carefully, for we are not our own. Let's wear his name gratefully, because we are bought with a great price. And let's wear his name joyfully, because our names are written in heaven. And with the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, upon those of us here, those who we love, and those whom no one loves, this day and every day we have left to live. Well, that end. Amen.